I'm Pastor Glenn Van Note. Um, we are putting on this conference, uh, this group of meetings, uh, because here at our church in the last three years, we have experienced two different occasions of people that were engaged in uh, polygamous relationships coming from within our fellowship. Um, now we had, <clears throat> last fall, I had been in contact with Karen and Dave. Oh, there you are. Hi. Okay. Well, I, I knew you were over here. Um, uh, about doing a conference, it didn't work out. Uh, and then when things happened a couple months ago, we thought, okay, we need to move forward with this. We need to make this a point. Uh, now, uh, Doris has been very gracious to come and share with us. Uh, she has come out of polygamy. Uh, she has the Shield and Refuge Ministries that reaches out to women that are, are caught in, in polygamy and looking for a way out. She also engages in teaching Christians about polygamy. Uh, it's not just a, a fundamental Mormon issue. It is on the rise in the Christian church in America as well. Um, uh, unfortunately, you know, three years ago I was ignorant of this. Um, I know a whole lot more now than I ever wanted to know. But I think we need to be prepared. We need to be prepared to give an answer. And so that's what this, this conference is all about, is to give an answer so that when we are faced with uh, this, this topic, and I think we'll be faced with it more and more as things come on, um, we'll have an answer to give, a biblical, God-based answer. So uh, we have three speakers tonight. Uh, Doris is, is going to share a little bit about uh, the things that she's learned about polygamy. Um, and then we're going to hear the testimony from uh, Karen Bradshaw and from Dave Burt, who uh, were raised in polygamy. Um, so um, at this point, I'm going to open a prayer, and then I'm going to turn this over to Doris. And I would just appreciate it if you just give her your undivided attention. Father, we bless you tonight. We thank you for the freedom that we have to gather openly, to gather whenever we want, to pray, to read your word, to sing your praises, Father, that we have such freedom that so much of the world does not enjoy. I thank you, Father, that you have gifted us with teachers, those that are wise, that you have uh, taught, and that, that can impart to us wisdom. I ask, Father, that you would give us ears to hear tonight, hearts that would be prepared to receive, minds that would be quick to pick up and retain those things that we need to retain. I ask your blessing on Doris, Karen, and David as they share with us tonight. Give them the words to speak, uh, and I just ask God that you would shower blessing on them as the speakers and on us as the listeners. We praise you, we honor you, we bless you. In the mighty name of Yeshua, amen. Okay, Doris, it is your stage. <clears throat> See if all of these on switches work. That one works. Yep. Mm -hmm. And this one. There we go. There. Yeah. Okay. I use PowerPoint when I talk because I do a lot of quotes um, to help you yeah, understand where some of this is coming from. And I think it's easier not just to listen, but to also read while you're hearing, and it has a double impact. Um, I just want to thank Pastor uh, Glenn for inviting us to come, and thank you for coming. And I just hope that you that you do understand, like he said, that we're here to share biblical truths about polygamy. We're not here to um, pass harsh judgment on any person or any persons. We talk about doctrine, because doctrine is a big deal when it comes to Christianity. We have to have the right doctrine. Um, and we want to share with you uh, tonight, especially what polygamy is all about. Why is polygamy even here? Why is it such a stranglehold uh, on a culture in today's uh, contemporary Mormons, Mormon fundamentalists? And we also want to share God's grace and God's love. Um, because it's out there for anybody who wants it. His love and grace is there. And growing up in polygamy, you don't know 
anything about race. You don't have, they, use, might, they might use it a little bit, but it's got the wrong definition. So I hope that, that you know a little bit more about polygamy after we're done tonight. Have a little bit of a stronger heart to help those who are stuck in polygamy. I was born and raised in a Mormon polygamy group. My father had two wives and 16 children. And for polygamy, that's a small family, very small family. Um, I am the director and of the Children Refuge Ministry, which started in 2007. And our purpose is to bring biblical truths to polygamists. When I became a Christian, it was 25 years after I had ran away from the polygamy group, I knew nothing about biblical um, grace or love, God's love and mercy. I knew nothing about it. We want them to know they don't have to do what they're doing. So there on the screen is a snapshot of our webpage. And that is, you can go there and find out about a lot about the ministry, what we're doing, what we've been doing. And then this one is a screenshot of our media webpage, where you can go on there and find hundreds and hundreds of shows and tapings that we have done, interviews of people who've left polygamy. Karen's been on several of them. And we talk about Mormon doctrine, polygamy doctrine, and why polygamy is here today and why it doesn't need to be here today. Um, a Shield and Refuge began in my own heart uh, when I first became a Christian, within a few hours after I became a Christian in 1989, but God didn't make it a reality until many years later in 2007. And since that time, we have uh, been active in sharing biblical truths to Christians about polygamy and to polygamists. Uh, about, oh, you don't have to do this. We have helped people leave polygamy and uh, we help them after they get out. We, if we don't help them get out and they need help afterwards, we will come alongside and help them as in any way that we can, um, whether it's financial or, or, or scriptural or biblical or, or you know mentoring, however, we can do that. Uh, well, I was born and raised in the Kingston group a particularly devious and oppressive polygamy group. They all are, but this one is particularly bad. My mother was the second wife, uh, and in polygamy a man can only, well, in, in America, a man can only have one legal wife. So in polygamy, a plural wife <clears throat> is called a spiritual wife. She's not legal, of course. So his that second family, my father's second family, which would be my, my mother's kids, us kids, weren't legal, not as far as having legal protection or legal considerations. Uh, we, we couldn't claim him as being our father. He couldn't claim us as being his children. We didn't have his last name. We couldn't call him by name. We had to call him by his first name. Uh, the other family called him dad. We had to, we couldn't do that. Uh, the other family had his last name. We had a fake last name. My m early memories, uh, of course, as a child, you don't understand what polygamy is. You don't know that you're in a cult and that they have strange marriage practices. But children, if when you grow up not knowing anything else, you don't know that anything else it, it can be viable. You, you're taught that's the truth and you believe it because that's all you've ever learned. In the Kingston group, <clears throat> the children aren't, aren't allowed to know that the parents are polygamous until they're old enough to keep it a secret. I found out when I was 10 years old that the man who we had called a family friend was really my father. Um, <clears throat> I knew him, I had known him all my life that I can remember, but I didn't know he was my father. And since polygamy is illegal, we're taught to lie. How to lie to those who might question us about our family. And a child can say things in school or otherwise, you know, that might give away our secret that we're polygamous. And so they teach us how to lie. Parents will be in big trouble. And so we are groomed and brainwashed from a very early age on how to lie about our lifestyle. We were warned that if the authorities discovered that our family was, were polygamous, that the social services would come and steal, take us kids away from our parents, and we would never see them again. And my life was miserable. I hoped they would come and get me. I didn't care if they'd come and take me away from all that, but no one ever did. Uh, my mother was a very abusive mother. She took her loneliness and her frustrations out on her children. I didn't understand it then, I do understand it now. But still, she was very cruel to the children. And, and that's not unusual in polygamy groups. The mothers have frustrations, they have loneliness. They don't have a man around that, that can help them and love them and see them through some of these strong times. And um, 
And so she took those frustrations out on the kids, and it was very bad. Uh, but my mother, my dad was also abusive. When I found out, after I found out who he is, and especially when I started getting into my teenage rebellious years, he became my disciplinarian, and he was very strong in his discipline. Um, we grew up in a destructive environment. Polygamy is a destructive environment for almost every child that grows up in polygamy. Some are worse than others, and I don't want to paint it all with the same brush. Um, the doctrine is pretty much the same, but the, the experience can be different in different families. But in, in the Kingston group especially, but many of the groups, you grow up in isolation and poverty, and most of the time, a lot of the time, is downright child slave labor. Um, the courts have ruled against the FLDS and made them pay, pay millions of dollars in back, sal in back uh, wages to some of the kids that had to go through that childhood labor um, without being paid. As I grew older and my life became worse and worse, uh, my heart's desire was to get out. I wanted to escape. Uh, at 16 years old, I knew I wanted to get out. My dad said he was going to see to it I got to heaven if he had to kick me all the way there. And I told myself I didn't want to go there if that's what it was. If God, and of course, until I became a Christian, I had no idea that God doesn't take people to heaven and to be booted there. So I decided at that point when I was 18, I was going to run, and I did. I ran away in the middle of the night and I was 18 years old, and they tried to find me. Uh, they couldn't, and, and I was free, at least I thought I was free, I was, I was free from them. But true freedom didn't really come until 25 years later when I became a Christian and discovered God's grace and through the cross of Jesus that salvation is by grace alone, <laughs> through Jesus Christ alone, and not through polygamy, and not through the polygamy group. They have a group God, and if you don't belong to that group, you don't have God, you can't have God. So you have to have that group God. And, and, of course, when I discovered this, it was Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9 that did it. But it, it was then that I wanted to shout out to every person trapped in Mormon polygamy group, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. And I figured that most of the polygamous women, if they could, could be convinced or find out and discover that they don't have to do what they're doing, they'd leave. And if all the women left, there wouldn't be any polygamy, would there? <laughs> So that was in the fall of 1989 that I became a Christian. And even though the, the ministry to polygamists was on my heart from that time, God did not allow it to become a reality um, until he sent me through his school of discipline and discipleship and deep, deep Bible study. The, the ministry was launched in 2007 when the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, uh, came out. It was produced. Uh, we have some of them over there on the table. They're free. Take one if you want. Take several if you want. Hand them out to friends. If you know people from polygamy groups, take them and hand them out to them too. Um, but the producers had requested that I participate in the video and, and maybe help find other people that could be interviewed for the video. And then when it was released, it took about a year to, to produce. And when it was released, they approached me. They had known my heart to have a ministry to the polygamists. So they approached me and said they would umbrella me if I would start a ministry upon the launching of this DVD, which was my heart's desire. And I did. Many Christians that we talk with, in fact, most Christians that we talked with are not aware of the deep doctrines of polygamy and why it's even part of the American culture. Uh, why is it even here? Uh, polygamy is not a live and let live situation at all. It is not. It's important to understand about why they live it, where it came from, and why they live it, if you want to reach out to polygamists at all, and if you want to understand them. It's a struggle. I call it a, a, a stranglehold and a stronghold. Now, it's a stranglehold in all of the Mormon culture, even the LDS church. It's a stranglehold with them because their prophet, Joseph Smith, started it, and they will, they will defend to the death the polygamy of the early Mormon pioneers and the Joseph Smith. But it's a stronghold as well, and only the power of God, we know that, can break through that stronghold and demolish those strongholds that are in individuals' hearts and minds about polygamy. Joseph Smith, we're going to briefly do a little history here. Joseph Smith is a highly revered prophet and founding prophet of the Mormon Church, the LDS Church, and of the, the, the today's contemporary polygamy groups. 
He had 34 wives himself. Um, he claimed that God had blessed Abraham, Jacob, and David because they had multiple wives. He secretly taught plural marriage, and he taught that it was an essential, it was a requirement for eternal life. And in that one doctrinal statement, when he said it was required, he changed the gospel, and he made polygamy the savior instead of Jesus. That's bad. And polygamists, polygamists believe that today. They don't believe it in those, in those words I just said, but in essence, that's exactly what it is. If you're depending on polygamy to save you, Jesus isn't your savior. Um, now, even though polygamy is illegal, and it was when Joseph Smith, um, did I go too far? It was when Joseph Smith started um, polygamy, it was illegal. In fact, it's been illegal in every geographical location that the Mormons ever lived. Um, from U.S., United States, Canada, Mexico, all through the Intermountain West, tens of thousands of people today live polygamy. They, believe it or not, they do. From 40 to 100,000 people are in polygamy, and that's a, a low estimate. Uh, we don't really know exactly how many. But Joseph Smith wrote the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants to the Mormons that is their scripture. The Bible kind of takes a third or fourth place back there somewhere. They don't rely upon this, but they do rely, rely on these two books. The Book of Mormon is called the Keystone of Mormonism, and yet it calls polygamy an abomination and forbids it. The Doctrine and Covenants, with Joseph Smith wrote both of these books, but the Doctrine and Covenants commands Abraham and Jacob and David and Solomon because they were polygamous. And it's in this book that Joseph Smith said that God said to begin living polygamy again, and he called it the New and Everlasting Covenant. Now, Joseph Smith said that he had a revelation from God to restore polygamy back to biblical standards, and he was, that he was called to restore a lost gospel. We need to know that, because Christians know the gospel was never lost. God promised his word would endure forever. But I have never met anyone, either in the LDS church or in a polygamy group, that knows that a restoration, which they call the Mormon church, is back to the original. And the original marriage was monogamy. Now, Joseph Smith would tell his prospective plural wives that God commanded polygamy and she would be destroyed if she refused his proposal, but if she accepted, her salvation and her family's salvation was secure. You see how they're changing who the Savior is? Now, you need to know that same threat of destruction uh, is made every day in fem in, to females in polygamy groups. Every day. I learned that all my life, that if I didn't accept polygamy and marry a uh, a plural husband, uh, be, become a plural wife, uh, God would destroy me. And actually, that's exactly what Joseph Smith told his wife, Emma, from the Doctrine of Covenants. He said, let mine handmaid Emma Smith receive all these plural wives that I've given to my servant Joseph. And I command mine handmaid Emma Smith to abide and cleave to my servant Joseph and to none else. But if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed saith the Lord, for I am the Lord thy God, and will destroy her if she abide not in my law. And that law is plural marriage. And he is commanding Joseph Smith's wife to let him have all the women he wants, but and she's not to complain about it. And if she does, he'll destroy her, but she gets, he gets to have all the women he wants. And these goes on today. And these are very powerful threats, especially for people who might believe that God really did say that. Um, when I escaped, when I ran away, uh, my mind was filled with that kind of doctrine and I expected every moment that God was going to destroy me because I ran away from polygamy. I really did. For years I lived under that threat. And I expected that maybe day or night, any time, God might just hit me with a lightning bolt and remain me on the spot. I expected it. You know, I lived in that fear. But many people who want to live polygamy won't leave for that very reason. They are afraid. They're afraid of what God will do to them and afraid of their eternity if they do leave. On the other hand, they make promises that in God's name, of course, all this is done in God's name, uh, that those who comply with polygamy, uh, and Joseph Smith used these promises too, um, that they would achieve eternal life. And this is, a, uh, he, he uh, proposed to a 14-year-old girl who named Helen Mark Kimball, and he said the principle of celestial marriage after which he said to me, and this is her journal that we get this from, 
After which he said to me, if you will take this step, it will ensure your eternal salvation and exaltation and that of your father's household and all of your kindred. This promise was so great that I willingly gave myself to purchase so glorious a reward. Didn't Jesus purchase that on the cross? And yet they're purchasing it by the pain of polygamy because she and her family would be saved if she would become Joseph Smith's pearl wife. He was 37, she was 14. And she did, she fell into that. He placed the burden of her family's salvation on her, 14 year old girl. After Joseph Smith's death, well, I've heard of Brigham Young, he assumed the Mormon leadership and he brought the Mormons west and polygamy uh, west from Nauvoo, Illinois. And he stacked up a total of 56 wives and he preached that only those who entered into polygamy could become gods. Of course, they believe you can become a god too. Heber C. Kimball was a leader in the early Mormon church and he had a total of 45 wives and he boasted, I think no more about taking another wife than I do about yeah. buying a cow. Now what category does that put a plural wife in in their own minds, in their own speaking? Um, they had little respect for traditional marriage, obviously. The first seven presidents of the LDS church were polygamists and they all taught from the pulpit that polygamy was necessary for eternal life and if you didn't comply, you would be destroyed. This is the foundation of the LDS church and the <coughs> polygamy groups today. That's the stranglehold that polygamy has on our culture, are, are these teachings, hell and damnation. In 1890, the Mormons were faced with an ultimatum from the federal government. Now, polygamy is illegal. Everywhere they went, it was illegal. So the, Mormon, the Mormons were faced with an ultimatum from the federal government. Utah wanted to become a state. They said, no, not unless you give up polygamy. So in 1890, God conveniently had a, gave another revelation for them to give up polygamy. And in 1896, Utah became a state. But they lied. They didn't give up polygamy. <laughs> they just said they did. Well, the federal government found out about that. Congress was upset. And finally, in 1904, they said, we'll take every asset you've got if you don't give it up once and for all. So in 1904, the LDS Church actually did give up polygamy, threat to excommunicate anybody in their congregation, their membership, who was a polygamist. And that's when the Mormon polygamy group started. <coughs> when the LDS Church gave up polygamy, the factions began to break off from the Mormon church and we have those polygamy groups today. And we get new factions all the time. New polygamy groups are being organized all the time. They believed, they said God commanded polygamy and they believed it. They still, they do, do believe it. And come hell or high water, they're gonna live it. And they did and they do. And, and now we have that many, many, many polygamy groups today. Pinesdale community is just one of them of the AUB polygamy group. So this map shows the corridor. Of, of where Mormon polygamy has that stranglehold. Uh, from, from Canada on the north, clear down into Mexico in the LeBaron polygamy group uh, on the south and all in between. Of course, the central location for all the polygamy has always been Utah. Um, but there's a lot, they're all through this state, all through Montana, Wyoming, Idaho. Uh, you'll run into polygamy sometimes, you'll know it, sometimes you won't. And here are these dots, uh, represent some of the locations of the polygamy groups, compounds, communities that we know of. There's many we don't know of. They're so secretive we don't know where they're at. But they're all over the country. And polygamists echo Joseph Smith that they teach that God never punished men in the Bible for living polygamy or told them it was wrong. So it must be okay. I mean, after all, Abraham did, didn't he? He was a righteous man. And so they use this, not understanding the scripture at all. We're gonna go through some of that too later on. However, if you read about every polygamy family in the story, uh, story in the Bible, every one of them is negative. There's not one polygamy story in the Bible that has a positive outcome or a positive um, message in it. There's the sorrow and the contention and the jealousies and, and destructiveness that happens in their lives, especially King David's life, how destructive his family became because of his polygamy and murder, which ended in, in murder. And um, so we ask, we want to ask anybody who's uh, trying to advocate for polygamy, is that a good example for biblical polygamy? They say, well, polygamy's in the Bible. Well, yeah, so it's rape and murder. 
You know, just because it's there, <laughs> you're not going to find a commandment to do it. And of course, the, the purpose of the Shield and Refuge Ministry is to bring the biblical truths to polygamists because if they know the truth, guess what that does? It will set you free. Although Mormon polygamists, they're known, by the way, as Mormon fundamentalists or polygamy groups or, you know, these, these names or labels. But they are not part of the mainstream LDS church. The LDS church does not want to be connected at all with the Mormon fundamentalist groups. But they do follow the original Mormon teachings. So they are Mormon. In fact, they're more Mormon than the Mormons are because they follow the original teachings of the LDS church. One of them is they teach that Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers and that Jesus is a polygamist. Now, if you're going to talk to a polygamist and you get to any kind of a, of a dialogue that has to do with scriptural dialogue, remember when they say Jesus, they're talking about Lucifer's brother. They're not talking about God the Son. Um, one of the quotes is um, here, it will be borne in mind that once upon a time, uh, this is from uh, a Mormon source, that there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, John chapter 2, and on a careful reading of that transaction, it will be discovered that no less a person than Jesus Christ was married on that occasion. If he was never married, his intimacy with Mary and Martha and the other Mary also whom Jesus loved must have been highly unbecoming and improper to say the best of it. They believe that he was married to all those women. They teach it. They believe it. And they teach that polygamy is lived in heaven. And those who live polygamy here will go into polygamy heaven and live polygamy for eternity. And king, they'll beget kingdoms and, and the mother, the women, all the women will have what, the children for eternity. Is that heaven? Right, baby? I'm going to say baby. Is that heaven? Be pregnant forever. Um, but, but what they've done is created their own God, created their own heaven and, and their own doctrine of how to get there. And, and it's so far removed from what the God has revealed himself in the Bible. One of the most shocking things that I learned first on my journey to the truth was, was that Jesus Christ were God, that, that he and the devil weren't brothers. I couldn't believe it. It was just, you had to peel me off the ceiling. And, and that this, this God, Jesus, who is God, actually died on the cross for me. I didn't know God loved me that much. And it was amazing. That's what drew me to him, is when I discovered that God loved me. Um, now, the polygamists will believe God loves you, but it's conditional. You have to remember that. You have to earn his love. And you can lose it if you don't live up to his conditions. They believe that, that, that you must suffer, suffer the poverty and the pain of this life. And polygamy, in order to be worthy of heaven, were, was God who suffered poverty and pain and the cross so we could go to heaven. So there's so much difference in the, the doctrine. And as we were talking earlier, good news. Gospel means good news. What's good news about polygamy? There's nothing good news about that. You know, it's bad news. And, and, and how can a wife say it's good news that she has to share her husband? And not just a year, but for eternity. So when we say gospel, we're talking about the good news of what Jesus did for us, and they're talking about living polygamy. And our purpose is to bring the truth of the good news, what the good news really is, to the polygamous people. Now, after I became a Christian, I was driven to find the answer to the question, what is all that polygamy doing in the Bible? Everyone who leaves polygamy uh, will wonder, what's, what's it doing there? You know, because they use it all your life. Well, polygamy is in the Bible, so God must say it's okay. And so I started to do a Bible study. I wanted to be able to talk to people about the truth of polygamy um, because I was going to talk to a few polygamists. I intended to. And, and I had to have the right answers. And so I started a Bible, my own personal study. And I, um, it was a long study. Oh, it was, it was hard. It was tough. I compared the Bible. I compared scripture. I studied passage after passage over and over again. I read commentaries. I interviewed Christians, pastors, Bible scholars, and it's interesting how many people didn't have the answers. Really, it wasn't. Of course, God helped me through it so I could find the answers too. Um, but I also discovered that the scriptures that they use to prove that polygamy is God's will 
or them misinterpreting the Bible, twisting it purposely to make it say something it doesn't say, and and then uh, and then adding, and God said he'll kill you if you don't, kind of thing, you know. So the result is this book, and it's over there on the table. It's free. Take it. Take two or three or ten or whatever you want. They're free. Please. Uh, no, you live next to polygamists. You you probably meet them in, in in different places in your life. And if you have the opportunity to witness one of them, give them the book and let them take it home and read it. Let them take it home and throw it in the garbage. Maybe God will bring somebody along to take it out of the garbage and read it. You never know what God will do, you know. But they need to know the truth. Um, now, we have um, the bottom line in in the Bible study, and that is God never God never commanded polygamy. They said He did. God never condoned polygamy. They say he did. He didn't. It's not there. I searched. I looked. I cried. I prayed. I combed through the scripture. It's not there. There's nothing in there that says that God ever wanted polygamy. But one thing they say is, well, God didn't destroy Abraham. Why did he allow it? Well, he allowed Abraham to lie. How many times have you sinned and God allowed it? Did he strike you dead because you sinned? No. Well, why should he go out striking Jacob dead? Because besides, he was deceived into it anyway. He didn't hardly make that choice. But, um, but he did do it, and God didn't punish them for it. But their own consequences of it. Was that punishment enough? Consequences for what we do can, can be God's way of letting us suffer through bad choices. But the whole question is, one time I said, God, why didn't you just say, thou shalt not live polygamy? Wouldn't it make it so much easier to get our message across? And you know what he put in my heart? Thou shalt not commit adultery. He did say, he didn't use the word, but he did say not to commit adultery. And polygamy really is adultery by definition. God instituted monogamy with Adam and Eve. And that was his original, and it was his only plan. And Jesus affirmed it was true, but he was here. He affirmed the two shall become one. He didn't say the two shall become a community. The two shall add two or three or more or anything like that. The two will become one. And he never changed that. You can go through it, the entire scripture, and he never, ever changed that. Now, there are many times uh, where sins are committed, but God is great, he is gracious, he is merciful, and he forgives. He forgives, even polygamy, he forgives. Um, one passage Jesus used while he was here is in Matthew 5. He said, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery within his heart. If lusting after a woman is equal to, equivalent to committing adultery in your heart, because it's a heart matter. It's always the heart matter. And, and, and the heart will lead you to action. And so if lusting after another woman, what is it if you take her to bed and have a family with her? That's not adultery? What's the difference? According to the heart, the, the heart of the, of the matter there.